everyone. Thank you for coming on such an early Saturday morning. Uh, I love the fact that there was the presentation of colors because that lends perfectly into what this is all about. You have community standards. You have school standards. That's, that's what we're about in America. We're about our little platoons, as now Senator DeMint calls them, Edmund Burke called them. Education is local because otherwise you lose control of your community standards, control of the academic and moral education of your children. And who at first hand rocks the cradle rules the world. So there is nothing you can do that's more critical for your, for your country, for your children, and for your community than being in charge of the education your children are receiving. I want to start with, I don't know if you may have seen the book out on the table when you came in. Dr. Terrence Moore, is a, I call him the rock star currently on the uh, Common Core circuit. He is a phenomenal presenter, uh, just a brilliant man, and he's written this book. Out of the ones that I have read, this is by far the best. But I want to read the uh, introduction that he has in here and come back to it at the end of the presentation. By the way, the book is called The Story Killers. Uh, the meaning behind the title of the book is whoever controls the stories controls the regime. And that, is, that goes all the way back to Plato. So his argument is since they are taking out our classical literature, they're taking out the stories of who we are, they will control the regime and our children will never know who and what they came from. But why is it prohibited, asked the savage. In the excitement of meeting a man who had read Shakespeare, he had momentarily forgotten everything else. The controller shrugged his shoulders. Because it's old. That's the chief reason. We haven't any use for old things here. Even when they're beautiful? Particularly when they're beautiful. Beauty's attractive, and we don't want people to be attracted to old things. We want them to like the new things. That's an excerpt from Brave New World. And I contend with it. I'm going to start out by showing the similarities of where this, what the genesis of this is, and it's parallel to basically just entirely changing the dynamic of our country, the fabric of who we are and where we're, where we're going. Common Core and Obamacare have been on a parallel since 1965, but in the current history, Common Core was brought into Ohio through the race to the top, and Obamacare has been brought into Medicaid expansion. Both of them are nothing but control vehicles. If you go back to their genesis again from 1965, the similarities are striking. They both came from LBJ's War on Poverty. The purpose was to help the underprivileged and the poorest amongst us. Uh, the means was congressional legislation that superseded states. The funding is federal mandates and federal grant bribes, and it has busted every state budget. Opportunity point of crisis. That this has happened throughout our history, but particularly in 2009, we saw the perfect storm. And they took advantage of that, both with Obamacare and Common Core. But because we were so busy fighting what was the most obvious, which was Obamacare, no one knew what was going on behind the scenes in our state education departments and our governor's offices. Again, Genesis 1965, the Johnson administration, that was when the federal government's the nose of the camel got into state education. The, it is an act called the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and it was, it's reauthorized about every seven years. No Child Left Behind, which everybody's familiar with. Uh, prior to that, Goals 2000, many in this room may remember that one, particularly if you're in education. Those are nothing but the reauthorization of a 1965 uh, Education Act. Nineteen ninety four is when we saw the huge paradigm shift on the federal control of education. For the first twenty plus years, the feds, while they were now involved in education at the state level and local level through Title I funding, they didn't have any way to bribe the states. Well, Clinton changed all that. There was a when they Hill, Bill and Hillary got into office, as I say, uh, Hillary received a letter from Mark Tucker. 
it, it, it has become such a famous letter that it's actually a part of the Federal Registry. But in that letter, he outlines exactly what needed to happen, what he was calling on the Clintons to do in their administration, to education. And as you can see, it's to remold the entire American education system into a seamless web that literally extends from cradle to grave and is the same system for everyone. Coordinated by a system of labor market boards at the local, state, and federal level, where curriculum and job matching will be handled by counselors, accessing integrated computer-based programs. You put that into four bullet points, and that's Common Core. Only this is 1994. Uh, we, we, are, we have remolded the education system. We have coordinated it through labor markets. This is a managed workforce. It is no longer an education system. And we are doing it through uh, data, through technology. They could have only dreamed in the Clinton administration what we have now. The shift of 1994 was twofold. One was the fact that congressionally, the feds were allowed to use federal grants to fund state reform. Okay, that right there tells you there's something wrong because the grant, the grantee does not determine the uh, limits of the grant. The grantor does. So it was their way of coercing agendas into the states. We'll give you this money if you do this. The other huge thing that happened in 1994 that completely upset traditional American education was we went to a standards-based reform. Outcome-based education, some of you have heard it referred to. Um, most parents know it as the phenomenon of teaching to the test. That began in 1994. It was actually began about 1996. They required the states to continue to, get, to keep getting their Title I funds from the federal government they had to have state level standards. That was new. There's many in this room, including myself, that were not taught. We went through K through 12 without state level standards. You had community standards. Your local school boards were elected, particularly for that reason. Your principals and superintendents were entrusted to know whether the children were learning what they were supposed to be learning. And they took a, you know, an occasional test. But it was not this idea that the federal government was going to determine the success of a child sitting in Glandor. But the, Fed, the, the huge shift with the Clinton administration, remember, is that they, the Feds could fund the state reform and we went to standards-based reform. The three principles of this uh, Goals 2000, if you notice the very first priority is to bypass all elected officials on school boards and state legislatures, making federal funds flow directly to the government. That is key, because federal grants come in and these departments apply for the grants, they go completely an end run around the legislature. And the legislature is not concerned about the grants because it's not a part of the general revenue fund. So they're not held accountable to that. that would, that's huge, and as you know now, that's exactly how they got medicated too. They go around, and a governor is a CEO. A governor is not like a state legislator. A governor if, is just like a, a CEO. If you're going to give somebody more money for their balance sheet, they're going to figure out later what to do with it, which is exactly what uh, Governor Kasich has done. So effectively, the takeover began. Uh, once states could be bribed with federal dollars, budgets ballooned. The grantor determines the criteria of the grant, not the grantee. So we, we basically would beg for whatever they would give us. The addiction was quick, and it was assured, as they knew it would be. Uh, federal agendas were seeded into the states um, through these grants and bribes, and once they're seeded, the state then is further hooked to the federal purse. There's no such thing as a federal dollar without a federal string. Yep. Then the state is then has to maintain that uh, program. Uh, the, the special federal revenue, it's not a general revenue fund, okay, so that's why many of your legislators have no idea what you're talking about. This never, most of these things never go through the legislative process. Grants are authorized through the controlling board, the legal basis. If you go out and look at Ohio's education budget, there's 25 pages of federal special revenue. All the legal basis comes from the controlling board. And the addiction continues, governor after governor. Because while the progressives for the last 50 years, very few of those characters have changed. It's pretty much the same cast of characters. But the governors that they're doing this through usually rotate every, every eight years. And all they're concerned about is their state's economy during their eight years. But in the meantime, they're destroying the state and the state sovereignty. 
What was the purpose of standards-based reform? Well, everybody, it's a typical progressive idea. Who can argue with better standards, right? Why wouldn't you want some quality standards for your kids? Well, the whole purpose of standards, though, from the progressive position was how do we get the teachers to teach what we want them to teach? Well, this is the formula. Standards determine assessment, which determines curriculum. And then we have teach to the test. This was never about changing education outcomes back in 1994 either. Again, the next reauthorization, George W. Bush, No Child Left Behind. Again, this is the same Elementary Education Act, Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. Nothing new here. He doubled down on the standards-based reform. Uh, burdensome unfunded mandates, inane accountability measures, benchmarks that no school was going to make, or district, it was a bureaucratic nightmare. It turned teachers into paper pushers, in my estimation. The focus turned from students to test scores. Uh, the failure of No Child Left Behind was a perfect uh, inroad in for this waiver that was offered through Common Core and through Race to the Top. The, biggest, what, the fastest way to big government is failed solutions. The state level education appropriation in Ohio, in 2000, it was $6.8 billion. In 2015, at the end of this budget, it will be, have doubled and almost be $13 billion. So in 15 years, we've doubled, that's just our state level funding. That's got nothing to do with your property taxes that have gone up. That's just at the state level, has doubled in 15 years, and we still have a crisis. The other big, huge element of that, the federal fiscal footprint in the state has tripled. Two billion of those dollars are Fed dollars. So Obama comes along and it's time to reauthorize No Child Left Behind or the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And in his education platform, he said he was going to radically reform No Child Left Behind in his OA campaign. His solution was Common Core. This was in his education platform. It can say that this is not Obama, and I, I would agree it's not Obama in and of himself. All the seeds were planted, all of the soil was tilled for him. But this most, most certainly is Obama and Bill Gates. Obama's Common Core adoptions, the reason it's so directly tied to the No Child Left Behind waiver, because the states were at their wit's end. In 2014, they had to meet all these benchmarks that they knew they were not going to meet. So while they basically took one noose for another, it got them out of the 2014 mandates. Ohio was particularly behind. But in this, what they call this uh, state-led voluntary effort, we now have national copyrighted academic standards. We have federally dictated data mining of our children and families without consent or permission, or restriction rather. Federally mandated teacher and principal evaluations and personnel structure. And a national assessment that drives local curriculum and determines Ohio graduation criteria. This is the fundamental transformation he spoke of. And to go back to MP, how do you change a society? You take over the education. And if you can get the health care too, that's a bonus. This is unconstitutional at a federal and state level. The federal government is prohibited by their own statutes in three areas, three different laws that uh, keep, prevent them from being involved in curriculum, instruction, or assessments. They have violated all three of these laws. There is a reason that education does not appear in the U.S. Constitution. But the founders knew that education at a federal level would be politicized by nature. I mean, George Washington spoke of the federal government as a fire that would consume everything in its path. That's why it had to be contained. That's why it has very limited enumerated powers. So how did the crisis get kicked off? Well, we had you know, the, the huge recession. We had the stock market drop. We had the uh, economic collapse. And in July 2009, just as planned, there was the huge stimulus package, $880 billion. Of that, $53 billion was given to the U.S. Department of Education to use at their discretion. They peeled out $4.35 billion of that for the Race to the Top competition. 
But the 53 billion was used to coerce states. If you wanted to get your state fiscal stabilization funds, as this was called, the stimulus dollars for education, you had to agree to those four assurances that we just saw. You had to agree to a common set of standards. You had to agree to a national assessment. You had to agree to do this data mining on your children and build this data system that had interoperable points with all the other states. And you had to agree to let the feds dictate your teacher evaluations. All right, got ahead of myself. Which, those four assurances at the state, at the stimulus distribution level were kind of general, but every governor agreed to those, including the, the states that didn't do race to the top, like Texas. Then race to the top was utilized <clears throat> to take those four general assurances and put them into a, a detailed blueprint. This rubric on the two thirds on the right hand side, those were all the criteria. It's just like a rubric that your child gets for a science project. This is what, these are the points we'll give you based on how well you prove that you're going to do these things. So Ohio, we, we won $400 million, lucky us, as did the other state that Obama had to win in 2012, which was Florida. Two top winners in the race to the top, ironically. But if you go down these uh, line items, you'll find that the, the one line item with the most points is single largest point line item, LEA's participation reforms. That's local education authorities. That is, you got the most points for showing how you were going to basically coerce your local districts into getting on board with this. I find that very telling. The great teachers and leaders was the next line item with the most points, 58 points, by showing how you were going to get your administrators and principals to buy it. The nucleus are the standards. Again, go back to why they put in standards-based reform under the Clinton administration. Standards drive everything else. This idea that we can piecemeal common core of Ohio, we can't. If you leave the standards in place, the system is still in place. <coughs> Excuse me. Bill Gates has been here since 2000. Uh, Governor Bob Taft received the first multi-million dollar grant from Bill Gates, involved with high school graduation. Gates financed the Beyond Tinker Reform recommendations that were legislated into House Bill 1. Excuse me. There's been some talk lately that uh, House Bill 413 is the answer to uh, at least what ails us right now in terms of an emergency measure, which gets us out of park um, once the contract expires. The reason that doesn't work is this right here. They're trying to say that the legislators never uh, there was no legislation that put Common Core in. Well, there most certainly was. It was House Bill 1, the last budget under the Strickland administration. It outlined in there that the State Board of Education had to revise state standards by 6.30 of 10. Keep in mind, this is going on in January through June of 2009. That deadline is the exact deadline of adopting Common Core. They knew that back then. The other caveat to how to House Bill 1, the language they put in there, it was two things. It was the, re the board was required to revise the state standards, and they had to revise them to college and career ready standards. Linda Darling Hammond, do, does anybody, does her name mean anything to anybody? Have you ever heard of her? Linda Darling Hammond is a, a, a hard leftist. She is a very, a very good friend of Bill Ayers, the uh, Homeland Terrorist, as I call him, University of Chicago. It's a Chicago plan up there. She's also very good friends with Valerie Jarrett, the ch uh, Chief of Staff for uh, President Obama. All of this circles around Chicago, and the Chicago Mafia, as I call it. But Linda Darling Hammond was born in Cleveland, and she's had a lot of involvement in Ohio's education reform since 2000 with Bill Gates. She is commended in our state board minutes for helping prepare our race to the top application. She is also, um, it was recommended that we follow her direction on our teacher evaluations. Again, she is a hard leftist. If you go out and look at uh, some of her reforms, it'll, they don't belong in Ohio. 
The national assessment is the, is the data path. $330 million of our tax money, through again, through the stimulus, $330 million was peeled out and given to set up these consortiums that we had to join. The consortium governing documents are the other piece that prevent us from having any more, having control over our education system in Ohio from here on out. We signed a memorandum of understanding with the PARC consortium. That was the consortium that we became a member state of as we were required to through Race to the Top. In our memorandum of understanding, this is a direct, uh, the direct paragraph out of it. It says, Ohio will address any such barriers through standard practices and protocols in order to implement the full summative assessment system by 1415. This will include, but is not limited to, promulgating changes to existing code and regulations and requests to require adjustments to existing budget appropriations. That completely annihilates our legislature. They have agreed basically to do whatever is necessary that the Park Assessment Consortium asks of them in order that they can be in compliance and common with the other member states. But then on top of it, Park and Smarter Balance, the two consortiums, they also got a grant of the $330 million from the federal government, and they had to agree to do certain things. And they agreed that because the Secretary of Education has determined that substantial communication coordination involved between the U.S. Department of Education and the recipient is necessary to carry out a successful project. Arnie Duncan is the contractor. He is in charge of your third grader's classroom. It's right there. We have to get everything to park, even to ch change our existing code and statutes. And they have to give all the data that we send to them, they have to give to the feds. Those are the two governing documents. <clears throat> Remember, the standards are the foundation. What gets tested is what gets taught. So basically, Arnie Duncan not only is in charge of your third grader's classroom, he's now evaluating your teacher. <coughs> There's a lot of talk that these are just standards. This has nothing to do with curriculum. This has nothing to do with feds are not in your classroom. But he basically says that once the uh, assessments are aligned to the standards, the curriculum will line up as well. And it will open up huge market forces. That's what this is about. Go back to 1994, Mark Tucker's letter. It was all about designing a managed workforce, basically determining what your child can offer to the state as human capital. This is not about education. This is about training a workforce. This report was done, in two, again, June of 2009, at the same time that uh, college and career-ready standards were being legislated into Ohio through House Bill 1. Bill Gates knew far more than any of our legislators did about what was going on. He had a symposium out more about, this is a three-page report, but I pulled a couple of the excerpts out of it. But he talks about the development of human capital for state stakeholders. Human capital are our children, and state stakeholders are not parents. They're corporatists and politicians. He talks about the failure of three rounds of federal grants. They had tried desperately to get the states to build these data systems and the states had not gotten on board with it. It is, again, against federal statute for the federal government to have a national student database. And what they did was they created one de facto through the states, because your st the student longitudinal data system that you had to set up um, to be a part of Common Core has to be interoperable with all the other states. It talked about, oh wow, this is how we'll get it done. We'll use stimulus dollars to bribe them to build the systems. He talks about how successful that was. He talks about how now they'll be able to uh, basically monitor the stock and flow of human capital. We're talking about K through 12, and they refer to them as stock and flow of human capital. Disaggregation of data, that's huge. Because disaggregated means student level. Remember that there's no student level data supposedly transferred. <clears throat> Agenda-driven special interests. These are, these are not citizens and state legislators dealing with this. These are corporatist, special interest, and crony politicians. 
Patel for kids. Usually held up in high esteem, right? They're, they're involved in every STEM program across the country. They're headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. Gates has partnered with them for a long time. But you can go right, this is their About Us page right now. If you notice up here in the screen, you probably can't read it, but it, where there's a little video, it says Transforming American Education. Down below, you talk, they talk about their expertise as Common Core, Educator Effectiveness, and Human Capital Development. The, this is who are, is being entrusted to our children. Our children are being entrusted to them, rather. They put a tweet out about two weeks ago to superintendents and principals. How healthy is your human capital? Take our assessment. The bit, the number one myth is that this was state-led. This was not state-led. The National Governors Association, the Council of Chief State School Officers, are not legislators. They're private trade organizations that receive millions of dollars from the federal government and from, uh, from special interests like Bill Gates. This is their public license page. It says clearly on there that the NGA Center and the CCFSO shall be acknowledged as the sole owners and developers of the Common Core State Standards, and no claims to the contrary shall be made. So not only did we not develop them, and they're not state-led, they're copyrighted. Again, on that same public license page, it speaks to the fact that the only the provision to get out of acknowledging the copyright, the reason you don't see copyright on all those consumable products and in your common core uh, aligned textbooks, is because if you adopt the standards in whole, you have a provision that you don't have to acknowledge the copyright. So if you adopt them in whole, you can call them your own. Makes no sense to a reasonable person, but that's what they had to put in there. Additionally, in their introduction, and this is the most concerning from, should be the most concerning to a legislator. These standards are a living document, kind of like our Constitution, right? They will, as new research is conducted and we evaluate the implementation of the Common Core Standards, we plan to revise the standards on a set review cycle. Not a set review cycle that Ohioans need, Ohioans can afford, or that Ohioans agree with. Because remember, they're copyright. And everybody has to have the common set of standards. Next myth, we have local control. Local control cannot be evaluated by a national assessment. We haven't had local control, quite honestly, since uh, about 1996. Once there were standards that the feds could tweak or bribe us to change. If you go out to the Ohio Department of Education, there's a school options table that lists all the different types of schools in Ohio, from public to uh, chartered non-public, which but most, most private schools in Ohio are considered uh, chartered non-public. And it basically states what, they, what their guidelines are, what's required of them. All public schools are required to follow the standards that have been adopted in the state and whatever the dictate is for the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which currently is a waiver from No Child Left Behind replaced by Common Core. This idea that local school districts can opt out, they simply cannot. It's, it actually uses the word compulsory on that schedule. As well as, in a practical sense, how is a local school, what local superintendent and local school board is going to put at risk the hand that feeds them, basically. You are not going to tell the, the state level government, the ODE or the State Board of Education, that you're not going to comply. Because they determine your, your ratings and they determine your funding. Now they can say, well, the funding is not connected to that. No, but what happens when they say, well, you're not going to get an A now, you're going to get a C on your state report card. You won't be able to pass a levy. They, they, have, they have done to us what the feds did to them. And they've pushed us into a corner and we have no way out. The other myth about this local control. This is a slide directly out of Stan Hefner's, our superintendent, state superintendent at the time, talking about the transition to Common Core. In the 1415, he has that the complete transition of full implementation will be in place. Implementation of local curriculum and instruction. Aligned to the Common Core and State Revised Standards. 
I didn't think this was supposed to be about local curriculum. A national and state assessments fully operational and accountability based on the new national and state level assessments. That accountability is then your teacher evaluations being in place. I don't know if any of you read this yesterday, but Arnie Duncan revoked the No Child Left Behind label from the state of Washington yesterday. They're getting ready to play hardball. The reason? Because they, won't, they are not doing, based on his rules and, and criteria, they are not evaluating their teachers and basically coming down on their teachers hard enough in regards to the rules of Common Core. The other place where the kind of ODE has shown their hand that we don't have local control. The Ontario School District, right outside of Mansfield, their director sent a letter to the ODE asking, what would happen to us, what are the repercussions if we, if we invoke our local control? Well, he got a three-page letter outlining exactly what would happen to them and basically saying that you're, this is what you are risking. And there is, it's punitive. Um, he goes and talks about because of the alignment of the academic content standards to assessments leads into everything that we've been saying. Any thinking person realizes there's no way out. And there's punitive damages at every level. At the student level, poor performance on certain assessments are going to result in a child being retained, particularly in the third grade. Uh, at the teacher level, poor performance by students will affect a teacher's evaluation. So now what teacher is not going to teach these standards when their job is on the line? And what child now wants to be the one opting out that's going to punish their teacher's evaluation? See how they, they've thought of everything. And at the district level, a poor performing school building could end up being an ed choice eligible building. So go ahead, go ahead and opt out. But you've been warned. Student data is protected. Myth number three. In December of 2009, there was a House Bill 290 that was a very generic bill. It was based on race or ROTC uh, applicants being able to opt out of school, community, public school gym classes. Within 24 hours, that bill left the House, went over to the Senate, and was cut and pasted what was Senate Bill 180. Senator John Houston at the time had a bill that allowed for this data mining to go on and the system to be built. He could not get it passed. The problem was it was required to get it passed before they could apply for a race to the top January 19th of 2010. Within hours, House Bill 290 went from a paragraph to five pages long, and that's how they got data mining into Ohio. House Bill 290 of 2009. It was the last day of session before Christmas. They talk about it in our Race to the Top application, they actually use the word groundbreaking, that they have removed all barriers on the application to, the, to our students' data through House Bill 90. And one of the other signers on the Race to the Top application, which I think is very telling, Richard Cordray, who was our Attorney General at the time, he had to sign off saying, there are no barriers in our current statute that would prevent you from getting anything you want from the state of Ohio. This, was the, this is the flow chart I call Building the Machine, or the Gates Education Corporation now. Those of you who have been in the Obamacare fight, this probably makes me the first thing I thought of when I saw this flow chart was the Obamacare flow chart. And it's very much the same thing. Um, one of the striking similarities to this flow chart is, while this is supposed to be about your child's education and improving outcomes, you can't find the word child or student in that flowchart, and you can't find the word parent in that flowchart. And the one thing that you can always find, when you find a someone who will publicly support Common Core, if they have done any research at all, and they are still uh, supporting Common Core, they have some financial or political benefit in doing so. Without fail, I have found a revenue stream from the Gates Foundation. It may be three people out, but there is always a revenue stream from the Gates Foundation that is coming in. They bought off the PTA, they bought off uh, the military, the military families, on this false pretense, but now you can move from state to state. And we get to the national sexuality standards. It specifically says
says in the introduction to these standards that these are a part of the common core curriculum. They call them core content standards. If you look at the contributors to this report, it reads like uh, a class of deviants, <laughs> to put it nicely. There are no family-friendly contributors to this report. It's Planned Parenthood, gay and lesbian organizations. It's, it's a free-for-all for deviancy. One of the new books that is, is recommended, and it's proof positive right here, it's on the Scholastic Teachers resource page. Some of you heard about it's perfectly normal. And some of the images in that book and some of the language in that book. And again, it's, it destroys parental authority. It talks about, you know, some religions teach that this is wrong. That's not true. It's perfectly normal. Some, you know, your parents may say this. They're wrong. It's perfectly normal. Every grade has, again, a rubric of what the child has to learn in terms of sexuality. In, in the first and second grade, it's primarily about your community and your family. This is on the right-hand side of this slide is actually an image of what used to be out on the Common Core Catholic Identity Initiative, which I, the left-hand side of this is a post that I did when I came across this back last July, I believe it was. First off, I could not figure out how. Common Core Catholic Identity Initiative. How are the Catholics, and I, I graduated three K-12 Catholic uh, children, how are the Catholics finding their identity in a set of secular academic standards? I mean, the whole thing, did they, not, nothing smelled right. When I looked into it, the right-hand side, that is literally, at the time before they scrubbed it, that was a first grade reading unit. There are books that are suggested and recommended that the teacher read to the students. I pulled the three that said family, since family is the focus of the sexuality standards. All three books sitting on a shelf in a first grade Catholic parochial classroom of six-year-olds, all three about homosexual marriage. They talk there, just like in the other, it's healthy. They're, a child should not have a preconception of what marriage is. A marriage is two people who love one another. Don't have a preconception of family, and families who loves you the most. I find this repulsive, also from the respect of, again, this is in a Catholic classroom, which tells me for sure it's in a public classroom, or will be. And secondly, these are the books on the shelves sitting next to, I guess, a dusty Bible which I think already has the perfect word about what a family is and what a marriage is. Amen. Again, it's commoncore.com, but we'll make it available on WJTA site. And also, Putnam County Parents and Teachers Against Common Core on Facebook, and that's important too. Bill Gates' video is very telling because he really maps it out. And this one as well, I've seen this one. I'm going to try it. I'm going to go ahead and hold the mic down to, to the volume and set out to see if this is up. Because let, let me back up and give some background on David Coleman. David Coleman is the chief architect and is acknowledged as such of the Common Core Standards. David Coleman has no background in education whatsoever. He actually was applied for a uh, high school teaching job in New York and was, did not get the job. He went on then to be a consultant with McKinsey and Company. Some of that, that may sound familiar to some of you uh, because they were the advisors to Enron. There's actually a, a slew of Common Core supporters or deviants that came from, McKin from McKinsey and Company. He's just one of them. But he was plucked out of there and was named the president of Achieve Inc. Achieve Inc. is a front, basically, for the National Governors Association. Chief Inc. is who, quote, wrote the standards with state input. But it was really David Coleman with about five other people sitting behind closed doors. And because it's achieving, it is, it's not a public entity. There are no sunshine laws. There are no minutes to review. Everything about this process was done covertly. After he left, after the standards were done, and after the states had all had them shoved down their throats or coerced into getting along, going along, he has since been moved 
to the College Board. Now, for those of you who have uh, children over the age of 13, you probably have committed the College Board. The College Board is in charge of the SAT and the AP classes, the Advanced Placement classes. What David Coleman is, the reason he was put there and what he has done since is he has aligned the SAT to the new standards. Now, to me, there's a couple of flags that immediately go up about that. First off, it's very obvious what they were doing, but beyond that, the SAT is known as the more cognitive type of test, more of a reasoning test or an IQ style test than the ACT, which is achievement based. Now, there would be no reason to change the SAT. If these were truly just better standards, you would sit back as the SAT board and watch, now you have apples to apples, and you would watch those scores slowly go up as an outcome of better standards. Instead, they've had to adapt the cognitive test to these standards, and now they've also changed it to their data points. So they can't even compare their data now. So they, they can tell us kids are doing better because they're now in charge of the test. They, they weren't happy with just having this, the national assessments K-12. Now they actually rule over the college entrance exam. I'll get the volume up and we'll play that before we actually start the Q&A. Uh, he, he basically speaks in there. He starts it out by saying that when, you know, when I was involved with duping, who doesn't say duping, with uh, getting the Republican governors on board, okay, this was a state-led effort. The governors wouldn't have had to get on board. I thought they were in charge of this. He also goes on to talk about the, that, the gold mine the data is. And then basically that's how they won the 2012 election. It wasn't the talking heads, it wasn't the political pundits. They won the election for Obama in 2012 through data, by, as they call it, pulling the lowest hanging fruit and getting them out to vote like never before. Mm -hmm. Which is insidious as just to hear that, but then you take that a step further because then he goes on to say that Dan Wagner, who was in charge of that, for the Obama campaign, is now in charge of the campaign for rigor which is basically to sell Common Core to all of these special interests, selling our kids' data and monopolizing this whole data collection industry. I'm going to go through the next sets of uh, slides, so I don't, I know some of you have children here, um, quickly. But it, it's important to know when they talk about this in Columbus that, oh, you know, everybody's on board with this, what's your problem? or you're a conspiracy theorist or whatever, that's not the case. What I would say, it's very, very easy to find all of the players in Common Core and all the revenue streams. The Thomas B. Ford Institute, they have been the biggest cheerleaders in Ohio for Common Core. In fact, when we had our hearing back in November, they were the primary uh, witnesses to testify in support of Common Core in Ohio. They were paid to evaluate the standards. And then they were paid to help implement them. There is no, no honest broker on the other side that is for Common Core. They, they, they've either been paid to do it or there's some, uh, something uh, other benefit they're receiving for doing so. But back in their report where they evaluated every state's map of the LA standards in comparison to Common Core, the, their, the forward of that report says as longtime supporters of national standards and tests. That they were excited by the possibility of what Common Core would bring. They were in support of national standards. Not, they're not in support of standards in Ottawa. I mean, you can't be trusted with that. This all goes back to, again, control. Progressive policies about control. And right now, Columbus is trusting and been coerced into trusting bureaucrats over parents. Uh, Checker Finn, who was the president of Fordham at the time, last August, he testified in the Michigan State House that, you know, it, it's a known that Bill Gates paid for the development of the standards. No one's even disputing that. And that's a Common Core supporter. And we get to, to the, the final Bush of the Bush Trilogy, as I call it. 
Uh, H.W. was the first president to actually call for national standards at an education summit. Uh, you know, No Child Left Behind was maybe not at the penmanship of George W., but he was behind it. And now we have Jeb Bush. His foundation, the Foundation for Excellence in Education, its primary purpose is to get Common Core implemented. You can see there's a Common Core tab up there. Uh, who the major benefactors are, it's a common denominator, Bill Gates, uh, Bloomberg, GE, uh, the Helmsley Foundation. It's all the typical progressive players. <clears throat> What's really frightening, though, when you look at this, is there's what I call the uh, wall of fame for Common Core reformers. On that wall is David Coleman, of course. But alongside David Coleman are two of our own state senators, Peggy Lehner and Bill Coley. Both of them are on our Senate Education Committee, and Peggy Lehner is the chair. They are, again, being monopolized and bought off by the special interest of Bill Gates via Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush, the foundation, has a summit every October. Peggy Lehner has spoken at the last two. If you look at who also speaks, though, it's nobody that comes to mind for those of us who even consider ourselves, but not Republican, certainly not if you're conservative. At the breakfast, we have Arnie Duncan. At lunch, we have John Podesta from the Center for American Progress. He was Clinton's chief of staff, and he is also now in charge of the NSA review under Obama. And then at dinner, we had Melinda Gates. I don't see anybody in there that looks like they're for real conservative principles in state sovereignty, state rights, or uh, community ed education. This would be uh, funny if it wasn't so <laughs> mind-numbing. The strategy session this past October, in the midst of the meltdown of healthcare.gov, strategy session Rx for schools. Lessons for Education from the Healthcare Sector. This, this is one program. It's one path ultimately, as you'll see soon. But also the thing that states are finding out. You see this app where you can't read the slices on there, but those slices are common core. It's, it's a piece of legislation in every state. This third grade reading readiness, Ohio didn't come up with this. The players behind the, the curtain came up with this. And every state's doing third grade reading readiness. They just don't realize that they're, that they're as common as they are. It's a part of the program. So the capstones of the progressive movement were launched, um, I should say catapulted, in 2009 with the stimulus dollars. And proof of that is an Obama 08 campaign. His education platform talked about advancement of 21st century learning skills, uh, that states would be required to match federal funds, provide support for both early learning and family support services. His big plan, though, besides uh, radical change to No Child Left Behind, was what he calls the Early Learning Challenge Grants for a zero to five plan, <coughs> investing 10 billion per year for kids for Head Start, quadrupling, uh, children eligible for poverty-based programs, setting up a presidential council on education, and primarily a preschool agenda that begins at birth. This is directly out of his platform. The other key thing to notice there is look who wrote his platform. And that's without question, you can find that anywhere. Linda Darling Hammond, the same one who, along with Bill Gates, wrote our Race to the Top application and is commended for doing so. They know how important Ohio is. That's why Bill Gates has been here since 2000. Sickening, though, is when you look and see what the Early Learning Challenge Grant, remember, this is called Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Grant. Okay, we have K through 12, now we've got zero through five. Governor Kasich's grant, two thirds on the left side, is right out of his grant. And he talks about the governor's vision is a seamless birth to 20 education system. Where we've seen that word before. Well, Mark Tucker talked about the seamless web. The U.S. Department of Education has a seamless education system. And Barack Obama's education plan, and his education platform, a seamless system. The, 
But here's the marriage. We needed four signatures on our race to the top K through 12 standards. We had the governor, the state superintendent, the president of the state board, and the attorney general. Look at all the signatures required for this race to the top early learning challenge grant. They're primarily HHS departments in Ohio. Out of a $70 million grant that we won in 2011, only 21 million of that 70 million went to education. The rest went to HHS departments. This effectively married education and healthcare. It states clearly in the grant that the purpose of the grant is to prepare zero to five for the common core standards in K through 12. You, they don't talk about education and healthcare. Throughout this grant, they refer to it as child de development. It's one single thing. This is the marriage again of the two programs because they've been on this path for a while. It's a whole you know, free lunch program, a free breakfast program. Your children can't learn unless they're healthy, unless they're fed. And so, for some reason, that's no longer a parent's responsibility. One of the things that's in here, though, is the fact that they basically are going to track your progress. If you're one of these publicly funded programs, which is universal preschool, okay, that, that sounds innocuous because they're going to put this universal preschool in your in your schools, you know, in a room in your typical elementary school. So no one's going to think anything about dropping their kid off for universal preschool because it's right there where they're going to drop them off for kindergarten anyway. The difference is you're now part of a publicly funded program, and everything about your child will be in this electronic file that they've set up called the Child Link System. They'll eventually link to the student longitudinal data system. Every single thing about your child, mental, physical, and academic, will all be in a single file. And it's required for home visiting. And early, what's required is early childhood mental health consultation programs to screen children using developmental and social emotional measures. This isn't children who are struggling. These are, this isn't your child because you've taken them out of a concern. They are required, any child that's any publicly funded universal preschool program, to have this assessment done because they have to benchmark the child. They want to know everything, remember? They want to know if Johnny sucked his thumb when he was in two, how did that affect his third grade reading readiness? And how did his third grade reading readiness affect his, later his uh, uh, income levels? I mean, it, it is insidious, the web that they have built around these kids. The same language is in Obamacare. They talk about the home visit. They talk about having to prove that academic outcomes are, in, are rising. Because if they're going to invest in you as a state entity, as human capital, you're going to have to perform. Further proof that this is a dual uh, operation of healthcare and education. There were over 200 letters of support that accompanied this grant in 2011. Every single letter was addressed to Arnie Duncan and Kathleen Sebelius. This one in particular caught my attention because it comes from our state board president, Debbie Terhart, our school board state board president. So someone who supposedly, uh, as she has told me, this is, this, what, what I am saying is incorrect. And I am misinforming people. This letter basically begs for the feds to come in and help us build our zero to five system. And we are going to open the door and welcome them. Now we get to what's going on politically. Okay, this Common Core is, for all intent and purposes, a nonpartisan issue. As you saw, we've got Republicans, Democrats, and everything in between all behind us because they've got to receive the right incentive to do so. But you have to look at your state and determine. If I need a piece of legislation, how do I politically get it done? Ohio stands in a unique place because we have every executive office, including the governor, is a Republican. We have practically a supermajority in our General Assembly. There is no reason, there is no excuse for Ohio to still be a common core if the people of Ohio don't want to be. The RNC, I don't I don't think it was an act of God, <laughs> but the RNC last April, April 12, 2013, adopted a resolution unanimously rejecting Common, Goal, Common Core, basically calling it uh, a straight jump 
and the nationalizing of education. And Republicans don't, aren't supposed to nationalize anything, much less education. Again, because Republicans, old school Republicans realized that when you nationalize something or you centralize something, beyond the political bias, it loses its efficiency and it loses its customization. So that would, education would be the last thing that you want to put at the federal level for control. <clears throat> we could swap that picture with dozens of uh, politicians up in Columbus. But the RMC is not known as being some, you know, hard right organization. Quite honestly, so far too many times they've all left the center. If the RMC has come out with a resolution rejecting Common Core, calling it nationalized education, that is the national party. That is the party platform. And the other thing that we don't think about is like, well, that's just the RMC. Those votes that were unanimous, those were our delegates. Glandorf was represented, as was the more liberal areas of, of the moderate Republicans. It was a unanimous vote to adopt this resolution. Not one single Republican on May 6th or in November should be elected if they are not publicly out saying how they're going to support the repeal of getting Common Core out of Ohio. I shouldn't have left this in there about, since it's up. I'll go ahead and speak to it. I don't know how many of you saw this article last fall. It came out right again when healthcare.gov was melting down. And Governor, or, uh, President Obama was caught that lie that if you like your pol policy or doctor, you can keep it, period. And George Will did a fantastic article, primarily about uh, cash for clunkers, but it was on the idea that all progressive policies eventually fail. And he ended it by addressing Common Core. And he utilized that line, I thought, just beautifully. If you like your local curriculum, you can keep it, period. If you believe this, your credulity is impervious to evidence, and you probably are a progressive. Republicans don't think like that. Again, getting back to the will, the wills, will of Ohioans, parents, and taxpayers, this is what our chair of the House Education Committee refers to as a small vocal minority. They like to put, you know, Heidi Hammer makes a lot of noise, but you know, there's not too many on her side. I have yet to find a parent that's not on my side. This is, this is just a slam dunk. Besides the fact that you have the constitutionality issues, which I'm unfortunately don't care about, you have the unknown cost issues, you have copyrighted standards that can be changed and that we're at the mercy of. I, I just don't understand how you can possibly argue this from the other side. So now they're left with, well, you know, we're just so far in, we can't turn around now. Well, that was the plan all along. It's the same way with Obamacare. We could repeal it tomorrow. What would we do, though? I mean, so much of the, of the basically, residue would be left behind. And that's what they've done here. This, is, this has been the slow creep for 50 years. And next year is the, the 50 year anniversary of what they started with the war on poverty. Great society. And they have, will basically have nationalized health care and nationalized education exactly as they planned. Getting back to House Bill 413, so I, I don't know if that's a buzz up here between your current legislators. Probably not so much because uh, Lynn Watchman, what, or Watchman was a co sponsor on the repeal bill, God bless him. But in some of the other districts where their legislators are basically being told by the uh, Ohio Republican Party to not get on our, our train. They're basically saying the House Bill 14 is the way to go. House Bill 413. That will put, at least put this emergency order, so on and so forth. Well, here's the problem with House Bill 413. It talks about uh, stopping the park assessment because we just don't know enough about it. Maybe that's not the best choice for Ohio. Well, isn't that the same case with the standards? These have never been tried, tested, or proven anywhere ever. Maybe the standards should be evaluated, not just the assessment. Maybe they should be halted. They talk about uh, that, it to, that the control, whatever measure we go to has to be approved by the controlling board. 
Well, the reason for that is not just because we all think Medicaid expansion and that it basically removes the vote for the legislator and don't, can't be blamed. The bigger part of that is what we talked about the no till left behind waiver. If we drop PARC without dropping the entire program and known as Common Core and without dropping the standards, the feds have to approve the next assessment we put in place. It has to be a Common Core approved assessment. Because this is the biggest switch. But House Bill 413 is not a solution. It's a distraction. Quite honestly, there's, there's only two sponsors on the bill. Bre Andrew Brenner, this is his fourth quote-unquote quote Common Core bill. Uh, Common Core distraction bill, as I call it. And Peter Stalford. Peter Stalford is my representative. I have, been, I have talked with Peter ad nauseum early part of last year. He refuses to listen. He's got, some, uh, he's got some other constituency, he, evidently he, he has supported. He is about to lose his race over Common Core. Amen. He came out with this, because this was a, you know, cover your rear end bill, thinking that he would take the heat off of it and he could distract enough of people in my district that he could convince them that he's doing something about Common Core and that we just can't do a full repeal. It's not working. He, he, right now he is pulling the lower uh, challenger. So this is, consider what they're asking us to believe. That a national assessment directed and paid for by the feds, aligned to copyright standards, which have never been tested anywhere, and were ne not developed by educators and academic professionals, but by, rather by a former consultant McKinsey & Company, who just so happened to become the president of the College Board last year, and now is now aligned the SAT to Common Core. That's a state-led voluntary initiative. I call on the Columbus, it's time for our local